Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where I would say that today's class will be a walk in the park, but it's far, far better than that. For one, it's multiple parks, and for two, it's the best parks, some of the best parks in the world. We're talking about our national parks all across the country, some of the most amazing places to visit. And we're going to talk about what's in the parks, what to expect if you visit, some of the animals that live there. And we've got the perfect tour guide for you here, almost a park ranger herself. Hannah Martin here is from Wonders of Wildlife in Missouri. She's going to talk about all these national parks, her experience with them, even has some artifacts here to, uh, to show you up close and personal some of the animals that call them home. So one important thing, national parks are for everyone. We want this class to be for everyone. So please use the chat box to the right of your screen. Hannah's going to ask you some questions to find out which parks you've been to, which ones you want to visit and everything in between. So answer those there. And if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to throw those into the chat in the last 10 minutes or so. I'll interview Hannah with your questions to get you some answers. So with all that said, uh, it's time to visit some of the greatest parks in the world. Hannah, we're going to turn it over to you. Everyone meet your instructor for today, Hannah at Wonders of Wildlife. Hi guys, thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Hannah Martin and I am an educator here at Wonders of Wildlife National Aquarium and Museum. I am so excited to be here with all of you guys today to learn about our beautiful national parks. I have traveled to so many national parks and have witnessed their beauty firsthand. But before we get started, I would love to show you guys a little bit about where I'm from, especially for those of you have, who have not been to Wonders of Wildlife before. Have you guys ever heard of Bass Pro? Maybe Johnny Morris? Well, here in Springfield, Missouri, we are home to the original Bass Pro, the first one ever made. But this one is super special because it is also home to Wonders of Wildlife National Aquarium and Museum. This aquarium is about, uh, this aquarium and museum is about uh, 1.5 miles long and home to over 800 species throughout. The aquarium and museum are so immersive and take you from the ocean to Africa. So we here are dedicated to celebrating hunting, fishing, and conservation. We actually have a whole section in our museum that is dedicated to the national parks. Now, now that I know a little bit about where I'm from, let's get started to talk about our national parks. So here's a question for you. What is the national park? So make sure you comment down below in your chat box and let me know what a national park is. And I'll give you guys just a couple of minutes to come up with some answers. I see that someone said a giant park. That's a great guess. Someone else said it's a protected area. Great answer. Oh, I see another one. Someone said it's a place to see cool wildlife. Now that is an awesome answer. I have a feeling that some of you guys out here have been to one of our national parks. So let's start our lesson with um, kind of a little bit of my experience with the national park and what kind of that is. So a national park is a designated area set aside by the national government to preserve the natural environment. So these areas can be small, they can be big, and they can be from deserts to forests to even volcanoes. National parks have a wide variety of biodiversity and landscapes. These areas are set aside for many reasons. It could be recreational, conservation of natural resources, historical preservation, and for just the sheer beauty of the land. So I want to start off our lesson today with my experiences at national parks. Ever since I was a baby, I've been wandering through our national parks of the United States. At first, it was with my parents who had me in a baby carrier, parent carrier on their back. And then when I was just a small kid, I used to hike trails to see waterfalls with my cousins. And even now, I continue to explore national parks with my family and friends on road trips. So national parks have always been a major part of my life and have helped me curate my love for nature. Through national parks, I have learned to respect nature, enjoy wildlife, and enjoy or explore the beauty of the earth. So for me, stepping into a national park is basically like ste stepping into a super mystical and magical world. So as our world kind of becomes more urbanized and industrialized, it's important to me that we have these areas where we can experience nature at its purest. I've been to nine out of the 63 national parks in the United States, some of these being Hot Springs, Acadia, Haleakala, uh, Yellowstone, and many more. So now that you guys have heard a little bit about me and my national park experiences, I want to hear about you guys. So if you have ever been to a national park, tell me in your chat box. 
What was the name of the national park? What was your favorite thing you did? Did you guys see any amazing animals or plants? I'll give you guys just a couple of minutes to kind of write down your answers. So as you guys are writing, I am going to talk just a little bit more, but keep writing all your answers and all your cool experiences. I cannot wait to read them. So now that we've shared some of these experiences, let's explore how our national parks came to be, what things you might see in national parks, and what is the importance of having a national park. So our national parks started when the expedition of Washburn, Washburn, Langford, and Doane set out in 1970. They went west to explore the regions of Wyoming in the Northwest. So they created a lot of detailed maps and created a lot of observations of the regions that they explored. They discovered lakes, mountains, geysers, um, mud pots, hot springs, and a bunch of wildlife. So here are some of their maps and drawings from their expeditions. So these creations inspired other people to pursue the wilderness of Wyoming and the West, and they started their own expeditions to seek out this beauty that they saw in these amazing drawings and maps. Specifically, this inspired Hayden's Geological Survey of 1971 that also included a guy named Thomas Morin in their party. So Thomas Morin was originally from England, who then traveled to America and became an iconic American painter slash printmaker. Thomas specialized in landscapes and watercolor. And during the expedition, he was captivated by the, one, by the beauty and wilderness that was the region of Wyoming. He started to create paintings of what he saw so that he could share it with others. And these paintings were able to fill in a gap of wonder where words could not be enough to explain. So his paintings were noticed by President Grant and the United States Congress. Many ex expeditions tried to persuade the U.S. government to protect this beautiful land of Wyoming, but the government just never understood the beauty of this place through just words. And where others failed with words trying to persuade the president to protect this region, Morin was able to accomplish this through his paintings and artwork. So thanks to the artistry of Morin, the government decided to create the first national park ever, Yellowstone. So Yellowstone became a national park in 1872. When the Yellowstone National Park Act was signed, this was a big deal because Yellowstone was the first of its kind. At this time, no one had ever heard of a national park or even the idea of preserving land was very new. During this time, westward expansion and frontiering had been altering the American landscape for many years now and has become part of the American dream. So the idea of kind of keeping something wild and natural was completely the opposite of what was popular at the time. But the American public was captivated with these paintings and stories of Yellowstone. They were so excited to see what this landmark would bring. So in 1906, the Antiquities Act was signed by Theodore Roosevelt. The goal of this act is to protect historical landmarks, prehistoric structures, and other places of scientific interest. Through this idea, he was able to preserve sites as national monuments so that the public would be able to enjoy them as time went on. After this, Theodore Roosevelt became the face of conservation and preservation for the national parks. During his present pregnancy, pre presidency, he was concerned about the state of America's wildlife and nat nature. So in his lifetime, he watched as buffalo populations went almost extinct. He saw how the expansion of the United States put nature in danger of being wiped out. He wanted to save it not only for the current generation, generation but for the future generation too. So President Roosevelt set aside 150 million acres for national forests, 51 bird reservations, five national parks, 18 national monuments, and the first four national game preserves. On this slide here are five of the national parks that he created. He was super unapologetic about the use of his executive orders when it came to protecting the environment. But not everyone agreed with him on protecting much land for the future. So they decided to sign a bill that would, or they decided to sign a bill amendment to prevent him from setting aside any more land for conservation or future national parks. But before this bill was signed, Roosevelt made a courageous effort to protect as much land as he could. During this time, he was able to protect an additional 21 forest reserves in the time he had left before the bill was signed. President Roosevelt is one of the most important figures for national parks and their creation. 
One of his most famous quote about national parks is as follows. There is nothing so American as our national parks. Since the creation of our national parks, they have been protected by many departments. Yellowstone was first under the control of the Secretary of Interior. Over the years, it switched to the Department of Interior, while the monuments and historical sites were controlled by the War Department and the Forest Service of the Department of Agriculture. There was no one department for all of these national parks and monuments until President Woodrow Wilson created the National Park Service. So this department is in charge of promoting and regulating the use of federal areas known as national parks, monuments, and reserves. Currently, the national park system spans over 84 million acres across the 50 states. So their goal is to preserve these beautiful lands and monuments for generations to come. According to the NPS.gov website, they strive to meet their goals of the guardians of our diverse cultural and recreational resources, environmental advocates, partners in community re revitalization, world leaders in parks and preservation community, and pioneers in the drive to protect America's open spaces. Now that's a whole lot of rules to be responsible for, and that's a lot of land to protect. Thankfully, there are over 20,000 employees that help manage our awesome national parks. Wow, we just covered a lot of history in a little amount of time. If you guys learned anything new or anything you thought that was super awesome, please let us know in your chat box. I would love to see what you guys found super cool about the history of our national parks. And while you guys are typing away, I'm going to share with you a few of my favorite national parks and some of the amazing wildlife that can be found there. So we are going to talk about national parks, animals from uh, four, three major sections of the United States. This way, we kind of get a big variety of animals that live throughout America. So for the West Coast, we're going to talk about Yosemite National Park. For the middle of the United States, we'll talk about Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And for the East Coast, Acadia National Park will be our park. So strap on your hiking boots because it's time to travel through our national parks. So here is Yosemite. Yosemite is located in California Sierra ne Nevada mountains. There are many highlights to this national park, like the Yellowstone Fount Fount Falls, <laughs> the granite mountain called El Captain, and the beautiful Bridal Veil Waterfall. Yosemite became a national park in 1864 with its major, major contrast of waterfalls, cliffs, meadows, and some of the largest trees on earth. So Yosemite was visited by Theodore Roosevelt and John Murr, John Murr in 1903 for three nights. During this trip, Theodore Roosevelt became super inspired to create national parks throughout the United States. So this national park assisted in the creation of the transcontinental, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> transcontinental railway, the gold rush and the city of San Francisco. So since some national parks have the ability to be managed and utilize their materials through conservation, they assisted these different projects in providing materials for their creation. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So since Yosemite has a variety of habitats and terrains, there are amazing amounts of biodiversity. I'm going to take a quick sip of water, if you don't mind. Thank you, guys. Sorry about that. All right, so let's get started on some of these cool animals that we might see in Yosemite. First off, for our mammal, we have bighorn sheep. So bighorn sheep have lived through a trialing life throughout our history of their species. They were super abundant throughout the Sierra Mountains and an icon for Yosemite National Park. But in the first 25 years of the park's opening, the population of bighorn sheep was lost due to diseases and unregulated hunting. Thankfully, the National Park Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife would restore parts of the population in hopes that they could become abundant once again. Bighorn sheep are hooved mammals with massive horns on top of their head. They live in the rocky terrain of the mountainsides, and they take advantage of this hard to navigate terrain to keep away from predators and to make it just much harder for uh, different animals to reach them. Their diets include grasses, plants, and shrubs. 
these sheep all have horns on their heads and the males have much bigger horns than the females. So the males will actually battle each other with their horns to establish dominance. During these battles, the rams will face each other and kind of stand up on their back legs as they run towards each other. And then they ram their heads into each other. It's kind of a crazy sight. So these battles can last for hours. And here at Wonders of Wildlife, we actually have a whole entire exhibit dedicated to bighorn sheep and their conservation story. So for our bird for Yosemite is the Northern Pygmy Owl. This owl has an adorable hoot that sounds like someone tooting a really small horn. These owls are small and diurnal, so they're really easy to see in Yosemite. They are brown, round, and have white spots all over their back. They mainly hunt smaller birds, like songbirds, and they typically stay perched on conifer trees. So these owls love to stay hidden within their trees for most of the year, but during the winter time, you may see them in towns as they move to lower elevation to be closer to food. Though they are small, they are still part of the fierce birds of prey family. They sport large yellow eyes to help them see their prey and look out for predators. They also have shark, be shark beaks, which help them cut into meat easier. And their talons are comparatively sharp and large for helping them latch onto prey items a lot easier. As for our reptile, we have the Sierra Fence Lizard. So Yosemite has a high diversity of reptiles within the park. It is possible to find up to 22 different species of just reptiles. But today we're gonna focus on this Sierra Lizard, Sierra Fence Lizard. So this is the most common lizard to find in this park. They live in rocky areas, specifically around granite slabs. These lizards have a beautiful display of blue along their bellies. Their keel scale can also be iridescent throughout the whole entire lizard. So Sierra fence lizards are diurnal and they like to spend most of their time basking in the warm surfaces in the sunlight. So if you see one, you might witness it doing some push-ups. So these, they are doing these because they're actually sharing their beautiful colors to other lizards that might be nearby. It's pretty cool. As for our amphibians, this is one of my favorite amphibians, we have the Sierra Newt. So Yosemite is not the ideal place for amphibians. This park has a small variety of them to see. The Sierra Newt though has found a home here and is common to see as a resident. So they are the most commonly seen, they're most commonly seen during their mating season, which is November to May. And this is when they migrate to ponds and streams in order to breed. So during this time, the tails have a great transformation from for the breeding season. Typically, they have thick, thick skin that is rough to reduce the amount of water that they lose while they're living on land. But during the breeding season, they can actually go back into the water. So uh, during this time, they kind of develop smooth skin and a really flattened tail to help them swim around. So these newts have a beautiful coloration of a gray and purple on top and kind of an or orange stomach side. So the newts have glands in their skin that actually help them produce a neurotoxin to keep them protected. Their bright skin warns predators that if they are eaten, they might be poisonous. So one of their only natural predators that can withstand their toxin is the garter snake. Alrighty guys, we're gonna move on to our next national park and that is gonna be Theodore Roosevelt National Park. This one is located in the state of North Dakota. So when Theodore Roosevelt was young, he used to frequent this Dakota territory to hunt bison in the 1880s. So his main Elkhorn, his main Elkhorn Ranch site was located here in the park where he spent much of his time. And this is where he did a lot of thinking and his conservation ideas started to begin. So this park became a national park in 1974 when President Truman signed a bill to create the national park in memory of President Roosevelt. So this park is not only one of its kind, since it's a memorial park for Theodore Roosevelt, but the park covers 70,440 acres and is memorialized as one of the faces of conservation and his efforts to protect America's resources. So some of the park's highlights include the, paint and can the Painted Canyon, Prairie Dog Town, and their 36-mile scenic loop drive. This features many historical and natural features throughout the park. So Theodore Roosevelt Park is diverse in its biodiversity and, his, its, and its historical meanings. <laughs> so as for our animals, we have the bison. And so the American bison or buffalo is an iconic animal of the National Park. It is so famous that it can be seen on the symbol for the National Park Service. 
So the story of the bison is a great one that is centered around conservation and preserving the importance of American history for those to come. During the early years of discovering America, new settlers took advantage of bison and overharvested them to where they went from 30 million to just 325 individuals. So Theodore Roosevelt noticed this decline and became increasingly concerned. He wanted to ensure that the future generations would be able to see these beautiful animals. So in 1894, he signed a legislation that protected the bison and punished those who killed them. So after that, the bison population slowly made a comeback with about 500,000 as their current population. Bison are known for living in Great Plains areas that have river valleys and prairies, and they feed mostly on grasses and sedges. So bison love to wallow in shallow depressions that are in the soil. They use this to cover themselves in mud and dust, and it is a possible grooming behavior that they do to socialize with each other. So really quick before we move on to our next animal, I have a really cool piece of, I have a cool artifact with me. This here is our bison fur, and I'm gonna kind of hold it up a little bit closer so you guys can see. This is kind of what fur of bison looks like. It's kind of soft, not too soft, not like a cat or anything like that, but it's super, super fuzzy. They have these long kind of curly locks on them and kind of this nice, deep, rich brown. It is super cool. You guys ever get the chance to touch some bison fur, definitely do it. They're pretty cool, but don't go up to a bison out in the wild. Never do that. <laughs> Anyway, these guys are really cool. So for our next animal in Theodore Roosevelt National Park, we have the golden eagle. So golden eagles are one of the birds of prey that you'll see soaring through the sky here. This bird is normally seen nesting on cliff sides and flying through grasslands to find small mammals to eat like mice and rabbits. So these eagles are brown slash tan, and they kind of have some white on the underside of their wings and tail. The golden part of their name kind of comes from the back of their head, and it kind of looks like a golden sheen whenever it kind of hits the sunlight. So a main feature of theirs is their large curved beaks for tearing into their prey, and the talons that they sport are also long and curved to help them capture prey as they soar around. Their wingspan are about 72 to 86 inches across. That's about six feet. That's pretty big. So these eagles are an exciting sight to see as they glide through the park. And I also have another cool artifact for you guys that have to do with the golden eagle. So since they are birds of prey, similar to our bald eagle, this right here is what a eagle's talon would look like. So you guys can see these massive um, talons kind of on the back here. They are super, super curved, as you can see, and they're super, super sharp. So these would be a great asset to use to grab onto things, especially when you don't have hands. So these kind of secure prey, keep them locked in so that they can fly through and find a safe spot to have a good lunch. <laughs> All righty. So as for our reptile, we have the Plains hognose snake. North Dakota, North Dakota has a pretty low diversity of reptiles, mainly because the climate doesn't really allow for a long growing season. They have low winter temperatures and a semi-arid climate. So this creates an environment that is kind of hard for some of these guys to live in, except for a few. The Plains hognose snake is one of the snakes you will see traveling through the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. So this hognose is small and it has an upturned snout. So this snake has many self-defense mechanisms that seem a little bit scarier than it really is. Hognose snakes are not venomous, though they can appear to be. When they're threatened, they will actually flatten their heads out and create this cobra-like face and seem more like a venomous snake. They will also hiss and make bluffing strikes and attempt to scare off predators. But as a last resort, hognose do something very dramatic and very unique to its species. They will actually play dead. So when they play dead, they will flip over, squiggle around, and seem like they're slowly dying. And as it rolls and enacts its death, they will become more still and start to stick their tongue out and keep their mouth open. The hognose is such an interesting snake that lives within this park. So as for our amphibian in this park, we have the tiger salamander. Since the conditions of Theodore Roosevelt Park is not ideal for amphibians either, there are few who live here. One of these being the infamous tiger salamander, which is the main salamander in this park. Tiger salamanders are pretty big, coming in about eight inches, when they're fully grown. 
They get their name from having this black skin that is covered in yellow spots and areas. And this gives them kind of that tiger look, as you guys can see on the screen there. So these guys mainly feed on insects, snails, slugs, and frogs. They enjoy areas that are crowded with conifers and as well as some grassy and open fields. So they spend most of their lives underground in burrows to keep themselves protected from getting too much sunlight and of course from predators. It is important to have this salamander that they have live in the soil. So they typically like loose soil and it makes it a lot more easier for them to burrow in. Just like many salamanders that live on land most of their lives, but when it's breeding season, they will migrate to their original breeding ground and live in the water slash near the water for a short period of time. So these guys are great for indicating whether or not an environment is healthy. All right, time for our last national park. So sad. We have Acadia National Park, and this one is located in Maine. It spans more than 48,000 acres, and it was established in 1916. So this park was created by the people who adored it and wanted to see it preserved and well managed for the years to come. They showed the government only 5,000 acres they wanted to preserve, and they actually created that section into a national park. President Wilson announced that this place would be known as Sierra de Mont's, Sierra de Mont's National Monument. So as time went on, more of the more prominent members of this group who wanted to see this place preserved uh, reached out to the National Park Service and wanted to get this re uh, National Park status. So they set out to acquire more property. And in 1929, Congress allowed the National Park Service to accept a donation of land that allowed Acadia to become a national park. So Acadia has so many beautiful features throughout its land. They have mountains and tide pools, beaches, scenic views, and historical sites. So Cadillac Mountain is one of the main attractions here. It stands about 1,530 feet high. The Jordan Pond is a beautiful nature trail that you can stroll through with ease. And this place contains amazing scenery and crystal clear water. I know, I have been there. So there's also the Bass Harbor Head Lighthouse that was constructed in the late 1800s. So this is a beautiful place to watch the sunset without dealing with crowds. So on to our animals that we have here. As for our mammal, we have the snowshoe hare. So the snowshoe hare is an adorable rabbit that inhabits the land of Acadia. These rabbits have some really cool camouflage where they are brown in the summer and purely white in the wintertime. So during early spring and fall is about the best time to see their coats changing to these really cool colors. So these rabbits are called snowshoe hares because of their really big feet. Their big feet help them walk through snow. So it kind of keeps them above the surface of the snow and making it easier to kind of get through. They are mainly herbivores and eat grass and leaves during the winter time. They're also nocturnal mostly, so they do not hibernate during the winter time either. Snowshoe hares live in areas with dense plant populations and like forests and wetlands areas. So I have another cool artifact to show you guys. So this here is not exactly a snowshoe hare's um, skull, but it is pretty similar. So this is a black-tailed jackrabbit. Let me kind of hold it up a little bit better. You can see their massive rodent-like teeth up here. I can open the jaw and you can see they have these really crazy looking um, molars here as well. Their skulls are very, very tiny as you can tell, but they're pretty cool. This right here is where the eye would be, and this is where his nose would be. Pretty awesome. All right, so on to our bird. We have the common loon. So Acadia National Park is well, well known for all of the amazing birds there, especially the bird watching. So since Acadia offers a variety of ecosystems and habitats, many different types of birds call it home. Acadia has a lot of areas with large ponds and lakes for waterfowl to, to thrive in. So one of the most common birds to see here is the common loon. These birds have amazing colors from the red eyes to the black and white patterns throughout their feathers. Common loons love the water of Acadia because they are crystal clear and it makes them easier for, this, for them to spot their next meals. So loons feed on mainly fish from the lakes and shorelines of Acadia. They specialize in the ability to dive into the water in order to grab their, play, their prey. They are super agile swimmers and they move pretty fast through air too. They can actually fly a little bit more than 70 miles per hour. So onto our reptile, we have the common snapping turtle 
Acadia is home to only two species of turtles, and this one of them being the common snapping turtle. So this freshwater turtle can live to be up to 100 years old. And they are known for their powerful bite and highly mobile neck that allows them to reach around their shell. They are typically found in ponds, streams, and sometimes brackish water, which is a mixture of fresh water and salt water. They are omnivores, feeding on mostly frogs, plants, and birds. The common snapping turtle likes to stay in the water for most of its time and doesn't really come out that often. They are easy to camouflage in the water and make to make it easier for them to hunt prey. So they are at the top of their food chain and are not really aggressive as they are made out to be. So they much rather remain unseen and slip away from any disturbances in the water. So here's another really cool artifact I have for them. So here is what a common snapping turtle shell would look like. I'm gonna hold a little bit up the camera. Awesome. So on the bottom here, you can't really see on this side right here, you can see there are these like spikes on the bottom. And there's like kind of some raised spikes on the um, different scoots on the top of the shell here. So this is what a common snapping turtle would look like. Um, an alligator snapping turtle, they have a lot more prominent spikes all over and their scoots here actually stick up, stick up a lot further. So they look a little bit more crazy. But what's really cool is the underside here. You can see, hopefully, kind of like that. This right here, this is actually the spine of the turtle that used to live in this shell. You can see it's little um, like ribs kind of along here, hopefully. So obviously turtles cannot leave their shells. Um, they live in their shells because it is a part of their body. So these bones here grew with the turtle and the shell also grew with the turtle. Pretty cool. And then I also have a little skull for you guys so you can see what a turtle skull looks like. So right here would be the eyes. And then you also have the beak up in the front here. This is where the powerful bite's at. So yeah, pretty cool. Alrighty, on to our last animal. So we have the American toad. There are only a few species, there's only one species of toad in Acadia, and that is the American toad. These toads are small with brown throughout most of their bodies and have spots, but their color can change depending on the habitat, humidity, stress, temperature, and all those other crazy factors of their environment. So they enjoy eating a variety of inverts and they can live to be about 30 years old. That's pretty long for a frog, so, or for a toad. Anyway, they live in freshwater ponds or kind of shallow watered areas. They also enjoy dense areas with vegetation for protection and cover. So during the winter time, toads will bury themselves in a pile of dirt and roommate for the season. Once the spring times, they will emerge from their holes. And for my last artifact, I have an American toad, toad skull right here, or a skeleton, not just skull. So we can kind of see what these guys look like under their skin. It's pretty cool. So here's kind of a top view. This is his head up here, and down here would be the bottom. And from the side, you can see these massive feet here. They use for jumping, obviously. They get a lot of power in their jump. And then this is kind of the front of their arms here. Pretty cool. <laughs> Alrighty. So these three parks have so many more animals than just the ones that I covered. Some iconic animals that reside in many national parks are the moose and grizzly bears. Now, while these guys are so cute and amazing to see, they serve as a great reminder on how we should take our or how we should take care of our parks. So one way to care for national parks is by leaving wildlife alone. Moose are a great example for this. So moose are massive and beautiful creatures to look at, but and they don't seem very aggressive in any nature, but their looks can be a little deceiving. Moose, like many animals, do not want to be messed with and especially do not want to put their young in danger. So approaching wildlife in national parks is very dangerous. While they do not want to hurt you, they do want to protect themselves and their young, and a way to protect themselves is by charging, kicking, and stomping, which can severely hurt people. So the best thing to do when you see any wildlife in a national park is to admire them from afar and to leave them alone. So grizzly, grizzly bears are another animal that remind us of how to take care of our parks. While exploring um, and adventuring through national parks, always remember to leave no trace. 
This means don't leave anything behind that you bring. Don't alter landscapes or habitats and don't take anything away from the park. So things like food can cause a major problem for parks since bears are a big fan of it. So leaving food out and not storing it properly can actually attract wildlife like bears. This can cause a lot of unwanted interactions between people and wildlife. So it's always best to leave the things better than you found it and national parks are no exception. We have just covered so many wonderful national parks and learned about some really cool animals too. So in your chat box, I want you to let me know which animal or national park was your favorite. And while you guys are typing away, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why national parks are so important. So national parks are so important for so many reasons from protecting our natural resources to preserving the wild world for generations to come. These parks are a great way for us to use, to use preserve, and protect the um, biodiversity of the United States and to study it further. So they allow us to manage resources and ensure that they will be there for generations to come. These places provide an area for research, firsthand conservation experiences, and a closer understanding of what nature looked like before we urbanized those areas. So there are also a lot of value for people who visit, Many people who visit national parks are there to see the wonders and beauties of these wild places. So this creates a connection from people to nature. Through this connection, people will learn to understand and respect nature. So they will become more encouraged to protect it and preserve it for those who haven't experienced it yet. Many people live in cities and don't have access to the outdoor around, around them in its purest form. So this is why national parks matter so much. They give everyone an equal opportunity to value nature, create a connection, and explore cultural values that are built in these national parks. The national parks of the United States are the most American places out there that can are open for everyone to love and adore. So thank you guys for joining me today. I hope you guys are able to visit some awesome national parks at some point in your life and experience the beauty of these magical worlds. If you have any questions, let us know. I am ready to answer them. And thank you so much. What an amazing tour of some uh, really amazing places. And thanks to all of you for all of your participation, questions. It was so great to hear everybody talk about their favorite animals they uh, they learned about today, favorite parks they visited, and all the experiences and all that kind of thing. So please, everybody, keep all that coming. And uh, we've got some uh, some great questions for you. And, uh, and I'm sure, uh, as this group always does, they'll they'll have some more. Um, so maybe start with um, one kind of early on, we're talking national parks and a couple people asked even earlier when you asked about their experiences, does a national monument count? Does a state park count? Um, can you tell us kind of the organization of this whole system? What's the difference between maybe a national park and a state park? We've seen, you know, national recreation areas and national monuments that aren't quite national parks. How do, how do all these different places we visited and want to visit sort of fit together? Yeah, so national parks are typically bigger. They cover a lot more like wild, natural areas. Um, they typically have a lot of really crazy landscapes to see. Um, national monuments, they are more like um, just kind of like individual historical sites almost. So like I believe Mount Rushmore is a national monument, things like that. Those are more just people made historical sites that we want to preserve for the rest of the time. So those would be typically a national monument. State parks are typically a bit smaller than a national park and they're more localized. So um, the national parks, I believe, is more governed by the United States as a whole. And the state parks are more centralized to the states that they are actually in. So they all are kind of different, but I mean, I kind of lump them all in the same bucket. They're all great experiences to go check out and just see nature at its finest. Awesome. I agree. If someone took the time to preserve, to lobby for the funding and preservation and everything to keep a natural place, you know, worth visiting, um, it's very worth visiting, which, uh, which leads me to my next question. People are asking like, hey, it's great that, you know, all these parks exist. What if there aren't any parks near me? What can I do about that? What's your advice for someone who, you know, may live in more of an urban area and it's like, hey, it's, you know, it's a couple states away before I get to one of the national parks I want to visit. So I would definitely check out any state parks that you have nearby because they will give you just honestly the same amount of great experiences as like a national park. But also another great way, as I know, online, you could do a lot of different virtual national park tours. There's a lot of people 
um, who like kind of vlog about national parks and they go to different ones and they show you the highlights and how just all the different things. But that would be my main solution to that problem. Nice. Thank you. And, and, you know, maybe even adding on to that, there are definitely national recreation areas, maybe on their way to becoming national parks. Um, there's also, you, you were talking about, uh, we were talking before class, they'd kind of done, you know, a run of East Coast parks and then a run of, you know, kind of Western, you know, Plain States type parks and everything. They tend, I mean, they're big, but they tend to be in similar areas. So if you have an opportunity with your family to plan it, you know, you can, you know, take a summer and see three or four parks over, the, you know, a couple of weeks or something like that. So uh, just because you haven't been to one yet and one's not nearby, you know, there, there's quite a bit out there to see. And I think most people find once you've gone to one and experienced it, you make it a habit to uh, to go to to more and more. So um, great advice. And yeah, state parks are uh, are really incredible too, and tend to have you know lots of uh, the wildlife that that you were talking about. Really amazing, um, you know, trees and hiking trails and and mountains and all those kind of things. So lots of, of great places to see things, including wildlife. Uh, I know at the end you're you know talking about you know to see the wonders. Of, I thought you were going to say wonders of wildlife and just kind of get <laughs> the uh, the time just reading it um, there behind you, but. Quite a few questions coming in about the animals. One of my favorites we get a lot, and I wrote a bunch of these down as they came in, is you know, what are the difference between these animals that seem kind of similar? So if I can give you a few of those, then I, we can do them one at a time. But a couple that came in, if people have more, please let us know. Uh, bison versus buffalo. I think you mentioned maybe it was synonymous, but is there a difference there? Lizard versus newt and frog versus toad. As we were going through animals today, those, those three came up. Bison versus buffalo, lizard versus newt frog versus toad, what's the difference or is there one? Yeah, so for bison and buffalo, those are actually the same terms for the same animal or different terms for the same animals. It's kind of like a regional dialect thing. It just depends on where you live. I think I kind of go between bison and buffalo. So it really just depends on what the people around you are calling them. But yes, they are the same animal. So um, buffalo is actually also a general term for cows as well, wild cows. So that kind of got thrown in there as well. Um, so as for lizards and newts, so the main difference between these guys is lizards are reptiles. So these guys have scales, they are cold blooded, and they rely on the sun to like stay warm. They're typically really dry and they stay on land for the most part. As for a newt, this is actually an amphibian. So amphibians are a little different in the sense that they have smooth, like smooth skin. They like to stay more in the water. They have to stay wet most of the time. Um, so they don't survive in dry environments. While they are also cold-blooded and they do rely on the sun, these guys are two completely different um, species, not just species, but you know, two completely different classes of animals. Um, so as for the toads and frogs, so frogs are mainly known for jumping really high. Um, um, sorry, they're jumping really high. They're a lot more slimier and they rely more a little bit on water. While toads, they kind of jump lengthwise, so they jump further, not higher, and um, they kind of just have a little bit more drier skin, like more of a bumpy skin. Um, yeah, so that's mainly the difference between all those animals. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for introducing us to uh, to so many amazing ones as well. Also, thanks for introducing us to all the artifacts there. I think uh, a couple of people were asking, wait, was that real? Which one was real? Do you mind telling us, were, were all of those uh, real or any sort of replicas or artificial? Um, if you want, Even if you've got them nearby and one kind of flipped through them, people were, were really fascinated by those. And, and a common question was, is that real? Yeah. Yeah. I can show them all again. So starting off with our bison, this one is definitely real right here. This is a real patch of bison. A common question we get is, did you kill that animal? No, we didn't. <laughs> we got it from the internet. But um, this here is a real patch of bison fur. As for our talons right here, these are not real um, bald eagle talons, but they are basically a replica. They're very, very similar. Um, they were made probably by looking at another one or um, kind of modeling it after another one. Um, our jackrabbit skull, this one is very real, so it has to be very delicate. And one way you can kind of tell it's real is some skulls are very, like I said, delicate. So this one, Actually, you can see the light shining through it. You might not be able to see on camera very well, but you can definitely see some light shining through it. So it's pretty fragile. As for our turtle, this shell is 100% real. You can definitely tell from the inside here. 
it's kind of dirty, you know? So I don't think if we bought it online, someone would send it to us. Really disgusting. Um, this here is a replica of a skull. And you can tell um, kind of after you picked up a lot of skulls and worked with them like I have, um, you can just tell by picking it up and feeling it. But it's a little more rough, not as delicate. And it kind of has this almost like plastic feeling, not so much a like smooth feeling to it. And then for our last guy here, our little frog skeleton, this one is also fake. Um, it's kind of got that same feeling to it as well. And it is pretty thin. So typically the light would probably shine through it and it's not doing that right now. So that's a little lowdown of all of our artifacts. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, we learned, you know, we answered the question a little bit about how to tell the difference between fake and real. So, uh, so thank you. And thanks to uh, everyone for asking it. Probably unsurprisingly, we saw uh, a lot of people were saying, thank you for showing us, uh, you know, your pictures. We got to kind of watch you grow up at, at multiple national parks, which was, uh, was really cool. Um, so you got to be ready for this one, right? One was, uh, what is your favorite national park and why? Let's start there. Okay, this is a big answer because, I mean, like I said, I love national parks. I might split this up into like three. So first off, um, my favorite one, well, they're all my favorites. So Acadia National Park, like we already talked about, I actually went there last summer and it is just breathtaking. Like the food's amazing. The landscape's amazing. The hikes are incredible. Like it is just all around an amazing place to go to. Um, Glacier National Park is probably my most most favorite. This one is um, out more towards the west side, and that place just has beautiful wildflowers, amazing mountains, and such a drastic difference in climate sometimes. I remember hiking there, and we went from literally sweating to being on like a snow-covered area. It was an incredible sight. And then my other favorite would be Haleakala in Hawaii. I had the privilege of going there and watching the sunset over Hawaii. And then also seeing basically the Milky Way galaxy because it is so far away from light pollution and so high up, you're actually able to see all the stars in the sky. And it is such a breathtaking, breathtaking experience. So I would say those three are my my favorites. <laughs> Wow, great selection. Yeah, it is hard to, to pick just one, except people tend to go to one and then go to lots of them because they're all so cool. And it's sort of, yeah, it's really hard to, to pick a favorite, uh, which maybe leads to uh, what's next on your list. If there's one that you could visit next, um, what have you? which one have you been really, really anxious to go visit? Great question. Um, so my family, we typically travel together to national parks. So we've kind of accomplished the East Coast. So we're getting ready to move on to the West Coast. And my, the ones I want to see the most are Olympia, or Olympic, Olympic, sorry, Olympic National Park and uh, Mount Rainier. Those two are at the top of my list right now. Awesome. I, um, I, I was telling you, uh, as we were setting up for this class, I, uh, there's, there's a place in my neighborhood where I can see the mountain peaks from both of them, uh, at the same time on a clear day. So, um, so definitely let me know if you're going to be out those. I would highly, I haven't been to those yet, which is crazy because I can see them. Uh, I'd also recommend for anyone who's a fan of all the Roadrunner cartoons, the stuff in Southern Utah is so amazing that Arches and Zion and Canyonlands and all those were just like, I remember seeing that for the first time thinking, I thought someone made these landscapes up for cartoons. They're so incredibly real. Um, and that's one group you can see a lot of them in in, uh, in just a few days. Um, also recommend Channel Islands off the coast of California. So, so many great ones. Um, so many have been, uh, people have been telling us, uh, you know, all of their favorites and great experiences and everything. So we want to thank everybody for sharing all those with us. And hopefully uh, you were inspired today to get out and uh, make a list of parks you want to visit yourself with your family with your friends and uh, make some more memories um and in the meantime um uh, you know on the way it's right in the middle of the country on your way basically between any two national parks you can stop by wonders of wildlife and uh, and go see hannah and the team out there so hannah thank you so much for an amazing tour thanks to all of you out there for uh, for really fantastic questions and, uh, and participations i know wonders of wildlife is back here regularly so we hope to see all of you guys back here for their events soon and on our way out we're going to give you guys some information to uh to learn more about what's going on next at varsity tutors what's going on at wonders of wildlife and uh like i said we'll see everybody back here soon but hopefully you have an opportunity to visit a national park in between so thanks everybody